Welcome everyone, this is Shadow Drake. So, I am redoing the simple phase change heat pump setup. So, what I am going to do uh, is I'm going to split it into three separate video parts, each describing different parts of it. So, the first part which we're going to go over is one, the materials you need to construct it. And I'm going to also talk about what are the different temperature regulation options you have as well, since the building the setup is actually the easiest part of the heat pump. So the building is the easiest. Part two will be all about how to fill it with the refrigerant and how to get it working, what considerations you need to take, how to step from one temperature down to another. So that'll be part two, and that's actually going to be the more complicated part of the setup. And so I want to spend a little bit more time on that as a separate video so that you can refer to that as you need to. And then finally, part three is going to be more about uh, the, the, the safeties to protect your system when it is failing, how to recognize that it is failing, or how to even know that it is working, and also other considerations. That part is going to be the most difficult to grasp, and it honestly comes down to experience. So I will talk about that on the third part so that you can better understand how your system is supposed to work when it's failing and all that stuff so to get started uh let's talk first briefly about what are the different temperature control options we have so outside of passive regulation which is typically just radiators uh, connected to the world atmosphere or a vacuum usually um, outside of those options, we have heaters and coolers. Now, there are wall heaters, wall coolers, as well as pipe heaters. Both, all three of them have roughly the same uh, profile in the sense that they are easy to make, very few materials are spent, very, and they're very easy to set up and get working. The caveat to them, of course, is that they spend 1,000 watts of power when active to only move 1,000 joules. Now... The only reason I say that is because when you look at the wall heater kits, you see the base power usage is 10 watts. Don't let that fool you. It actually consumes 1,010 watts. This is actually the true nature, the true power consumption. But it only moves about 1,000 joules of energy into or out of the pipe, net, pipe network or room. So just keep that in mind. It Basically, for every water power you spend, you get one joule of energy moved. It's highly inefficient power consumption-wise, but it is very easy to set up and available. The next up is the Atmospherics AC kits. Now, this is where it gets we start to get a little bit more complex for a little bit more materials used. And by that I mean technically it's still in the it's still made in the pipe vendor, still costs some iron, copper, and gold, but now you also have to properly pipe up the system. So you're going to be spending some more materials on pipes, whether they're insulated or not. And this is strictly gas pipes as of right now. I'm not sure if the devs will ever change it to fit on liquid networks, but as of right now, it's strictly gas pipes. Now, the thing about the atmospheric AC kit is it spends 355 watts of power. Um, there's 10 watts of idle power, and I don't know why it's 345 watts, but 355 watts of power to move up to 14,000 joules of energy. So right there, you can tell that you are spending much less power compared to the wall heaters or wall coolers, and you can move up to 14,000 joules of energy. What, what offsets this is the atmospheric AC kit has three efficiencies. It has an operational temperature efficiency, which drops as you get outside of the out of the room temperature working range, roughly negative 50 to 100 C. As you get further away from that, that efficiency drops. You have the temperature differential efficiency, which uh, if the input pipe and the waste pipe connections vary too far in temperature, that drops. And then you have the pressure differential efficiency, which if for some reason you didn't pressurize your input and your waste pipe to above 111 kilopascals, that will also tank how much energy is moved. So in total, the product of those three efficiencies affect how much of that 14,000 joules of energy is moved. So, for example, if if uh, your operational efficiency is 50%, that means you're only moving 7,000 joules. If your temperature differential is also 50%, well, now half of 7,000 is 3,500. So now you're moving 3,500 joules. And then if for some reason your pressure differential is 10%, well, 3,500 10% of that is 350 joules. So you can see how that plays into how much energy is actually being moved. All right, and the final one is phase change related heat pumps. Uh, it is 
it is difficult to quantify just how you how good it can move energy and it also has variable power you power usage because the thing about it is this is highly custom you can force condensation and evaporation in different pipe networks you can use pumps regulators active vents passive vents uh, liquid drains and all sorts of different tools at your disposal to force the state you know the, the refrigerant gas to change states and depending on your conditions you could have a massive movement of energy or something small so because of that it is a highly customizable system it is probably the closest you will ever get to making your own air conditioning system in this <laughs> it just in total and so it's hard to quantify just how good or bad it is so you actually have to understand the system you make and know how much energy is being moved to kind of get a good idea of how good or bad it is now for this build for the simple phase change heat pump we're going to be using two phase change devices and their power consumption is 50 watts each so in total we are going to be only spending 100 watts of power and depending on the refrigerant you can move a vast amount of energy or a very small amount but you know even if even if we move only 4,000 joules of energy from the phase change characteristics, that already puts it equal to the atmospheric AC kits in terms of max energy moved per, um, per, per watt of power spent. So with that in mind, let's actually get to what we need to build this. Again, the phase change heat pump being so customizable means you're gonna need quite a lot of materials. But for this build, we're only going to need pipes. Heavily prefer that they are insulated so that nothing else affects the term the the temp nothing else causes a temperature change inside your refrigerant. Two phase change devices. And now the last thing will be the counterflow heat exchanger, but I will make a small little blurb to that and that this is optional, but it provides such a huge benefit to your system, which I will explain in the next video. So if, if you are is still in the tech one pipe bender, you can just ignore the counterflow heat exchanger, but I would highly recommend that you actually space out some space for the inclusion of one to help your system be better. So for the most part, we're gonna build the simple phase change heat pump. So let's go on ahead and grab our pipes, both gas pipes and liquid pipes. We have our two phase change devices and I will grab the counterflow heat exchanger for the time being, but I will show you where it's going to be placed between the two systems. Now, as far as other materials go, uh, you do need two temperature sources, a uh, temperature source that's fairly stable and the temperature source of something that is going to be changed. Basically, it's going to be changed to the targets. Now, I'm going to go over that in more detail in the next video, but for the, for the purposes of this build, what I, we have on the left here, this is going to be my stable temperature source. This is just Martian atmosphere. And here is going to be basically what I'm going to be changing the temperature of. It's just some oxygen that I will cool. I will choose to cool down. Now, the very simple part of the phase change devices, and once again, phase change devices, those kits are made in the pipe bender. It requires some steel, but then again, if you're using insulated pipes, you should already have some steel and silicon available. So that's all that you need. And once again, counterflow heat exchanger, the counterflow heat exchanger requires that you have a tier two pipe bender, which means you need to have tech enough to get Electrum, Solder, Constantin, and Invar as well. If you make all of those alloys from the furnace, then you're capable of getting a counterflow heat exchanger. All right, so the phase change device kit. Um, if you've seen other tutorial videos where I cover these devices a little bit more. Uh, you may be aware of them, but for those of you who are just seeing this for the first time, a phase change device kit has two possible devices. It's got an ev evaporation chamber, and if you use the mouse scroll wheel, you get the condensation chamber. The subtle difference, of course, is in how the is in the shape of it. As you see, the evaporation chamber is wider in the bottom and thins out at the top. The condensation chamber is the opposite. But for me, it's very difficult for me to even see that. So both chambers have two connections on one side and then a single connection on the other side. The lonely connection is the heat exchange port. And that's what I typically like to face close to the, to the, 
two temperature sources that will be changed. Now, for the purpose of my build, I am intending to cool down that tank of gas, and this will be my starting point. So for phase change, just remember that condensation generates heat. So that's where the so that chamber will get warmer than normal. And so that's what's going to be connected to my stable energy source in this case. So that's where I'm going to build it right there. The evaporation chamber is going to make something cooler. So if my intention is to cool down, my evaporation chamber is going to be at my target. If my, if my intention is to heat up, then I will actually put a condensation chamber next to my target. Just keep that in mind that this is a one-way thermal energy flow. It is extremely unlikely that you will see energy flow in the opposite direction, and that's actually a sign of something is wrong. Now, what I typically do is I like to have the two connections face each chamber. As you can tell, I built with the double connection on a condensation chamber facing to the right, evaporation chamber, I will face it to the left. And you can't just straight connect them. You have to have some pipe volume in there. But since I want to also show where you're gonna put the counterflow heat exchanger, we're gonna add some space. So I'm just gonna build this close to my other tank with my temperature source. Now, to finish out the build for the phase change devices, you just need some steel sheets. Again, something that you should have available, especially if you build them. So first you gotta wrench them on, and then you gotta weld them. So that's my two chambers. And of course you gotta wire power to them. So, I mean, we're just gonna go on ahead and wire power to them. All right, now that we wire power to them, and the, and the system is on, I'm not gonna turn them on just yet. I still got a few more things to talk about now connecting the middles so typically what i like to do is to scope out a spot in the middle for the heat exchanger and it is a th length of three pipes so what i am going to do is just build this in the middle right here make sure that it's lined up yep it is lined up and now i'm going to do the same thing for both liquid and gas now the only reason I built those right there is because that's where the heat exchanger will fill in. But let me just show you what the simple build is. I'm going to build these off of single pipes because sometimes you just need to have the ability to branch out due to piping or filling up the system. And you're going to see that in the next part. And now finally, the last thing is of course, connect the heat exchange ports to the gas that is either that is either gonna be heated up on one side or cool down on the other side, as well as the, sta the staple source on the other end. Come on now. Ran out of pipes. All right, so as you can tell, this is basically the simple phase change heat pump. This is what I said, that the building is actually the simplest part of all. Now, this system will not work until it is filled with the refrigerant, which we're going to cover in the next parts. So to sum up, basically, you have a stable temperature source on one end and then a target gas that's going to get cool, cooled or heated on the other. Depending on what you have, the condensation chamber is what heats up whatever it's connected to. The evaporation chamber will cool down whatever it's connected to. Just keep that in mind. Now, this looks a little funky, but there's a reason for that. So when you get the ability to tech up to a counterflow heat exchanger, this is what this space is for. This is for a counterflow heat exchanger. And so I'm going to show you how you can add that, especially if you made the space for it. Now, a counterflow heat exchanger has three possible builds. It's got a gas-gas connection a gas liquid connection and a liquid liquid connection. Hopefully, hopefully you understand that we're going to need a gas liquid connection because we're going to need the flow of gases and liquids through this counterflow heat exchanger. Now, when I rotate this, you see the little arrows for the for where the gases and liquids are flowing. In this case, liquids are flow on the bottom and gases flow on the top. And you can kind of see that this is very uniquely suited for a simple phase change heat pump device. And that's why I build the devices the way they are. Now, we want the liquid to flow towards the evaporation chamber, like so. 
Remember, condensation makes liquids, liquids go to evaporation, evaporation chamber makes gases, and gases flow to the condensation chamber. And so then you'll just be able to just connect it as follows, and then finish building it up with some steel sheets. Like so. And with that, this is basically the simple phase change heat pump. It can work without the counterflow heat exchanger, but once again, adding the counterflow heat exchanger in the middle like so is what's going to help improve the overall performance of the system. So that takes it for this part. So hope to see you on the next part for how to fill this system. And we're going to be filling a system without the counterflow so that you can kind of see how it runs without the counterflow mucking up anything. And then I'll explain the benefits for it later. Thank you for your time. Hope to see you then. And uh, have a good day. Goodbye.